Isn't that wicked, honey? That's unreal. A giant cigar in the sky. Rain so heavy, it sends eels swimming through the streets. Eels. Eels in the gutter. And a sunset stops traffic in New York. Oh, there it is. There's always been weird weather, but today, thanks to the smartphone, more and more of these crazy events are being captured on camera. Oh, my feet are going numb. I think we should go. <laughs> today, I'm going to be showing you some of the craziest clips yet and demonstrating the simple science that lies at the heart of these astonishing natural phenomena. Welcome to the world's weirdest weather. Here in the UK, when it rains heavily, we say it's raining cats and dogs outside and other countries have their own versions, like it's raining chair legs or it's raining cobbler's knives or pocket knives. But I've never heard anyone say it's raining spiders, but maybe they should. Take a look at this. Santo Antonio da Platina, Southern Brazil, February 2013. No, but this is ignorance. The sky is full of spiders. Thousands of them swarming to form a cloud. No, but this is ignorance. You see a spider. Cara, dá até medo de andar aqui. It's an arachnophobe's nightmare. Cara, não, não vou aí não, velho. Sai daí, Robson. <laughs> the freaked out onlookers think it's raining spiders, but it's not. In fact, this cloud is a giant communal web, apparently strung between power lines. And it's natural behavior for this species. But don't get too comfortable, because elsewhere, spiders can and do get tangled up in the weather, as people in Dallas, Texas, discover. There were spider webs on the street lights. They were hanging off of the trees. When they were blowing out, they were about 12 to 14 feet long. It was absolutely crazy. Everything, I mean, everything was covered in spider webs. North Texas is tangled in sticky spider webs. They're stuck to lampposts, cars, and everything else they touch. Uh. On a scale from one to 10 of strangeness, I would say this was about a 21. And how they got there is even stranger. They hitched a lift on the wind. Many species of spiders actually use their webs to fly on the wind. It's called ballooning. Spider ballooning is most often seen in young spiders and they use it as a way to spread out over long distances and find new habitats. These special webs act like sails, so it only takes a slight breeze to get the spiders airborne. There they go. <laughs> By taking advantage of the weather, the Texan spiders may have traveled hundreds of miles. And it's not just the wind that helps our eight-legged friends take off. Physicist Joe Dwyer explains how spiders can fly using lightning. So the Earth actually forms this electrical circuit called the global circuit. It's energized by thunderstorms. When a storm cloud forms, positively and negatively charged particles within the cloud are separated. This separation creates static electricity, which can be discharged in the form of lightning. But some of this static electricity is not discharged. It remains in the atmosphere. Even if there are no thunderstorms around, there's still large-scale electric fields. They're always there. A spider's web can pick up a few of these charged particles. Just like in a magnet, like charges repel each other. 
Because the particles on the web have the same charge as the particles in the air, the web is pushed away and the spider flies. Now, if you're very light, like a little spider, then it's possible if you have enough charge on you or on your little web to float or to rise in such electric fields. Joe has prepared a simple demonstration to show how this works. I made some homemade spiders. These are actually little Halloween spiders. I've taped pieces of mylar on the end to represent the webs. So I'm going to take one, put it on top of the Van de Graaff machine, which will develop a big charge. Turn it on. And away it goes. <laughs> So the charge in the web causes the web to rise up in the Earth's electric field, taking the spider with it. So next time you see a spider floating past on a windless day, just remember, you could be witnessing the power of the Earth's invisible electric field. We've all heard of Movember, the month when thousands of men across the UK grow a moustache in order to raise money for charity. But what I bet you didn't know was that sometimes the weather <laughs> joins in too. Patagonia, Argentina. A strange cloud drifts across the sky. It looks like a 1970s disco tash. After about 30 seconds, it disappears. It's a fleeting glimpse of one of the world's rarest clouds, a moustache cloud. Cloud expert Gavin Pretapini describes what makes these curious clouds so unique. Moustache clouds can be quite thin and rope-like. The upside down crescent appears to almost rotate because it forms within a vortex of air. It's this vortex that makes moustache clouds so rare, as the conditions must be absolutely perfect to create one. A rising column of air, a thermal, encounters wind shear, and this causes the column of air to curl over and develop a vortex if you imagine a, a water spout or a tornado, that's a vertically orientated um, spinning column of air. Well, in this case, it's horizontally aligned. But whereas a tornado's vortex has a strong, powerful rotation, moustache clouds are much weaker, appearing and disappearing within a matter of seconds. They appear without fanfare. The moustache curls around, um, twirls and rotates, and then just evaporates into the blue. It's rare to get a photograph, even rarer to get a video of them. That makes this video from Patagonia truly exceptional, a rare moving image of one of the rarest clouds in the world. Weird weather isn't always as obvious as a funny shaped cloud or a freak snowstorm. Sometimes we only know it's happened because of the effects that it has on the natural world around us, just like in our next story. Qingdao, China. This once beautiful bay was selected to host the sailing events at the Beijing Olympics. But over the last decade, it's become more famous for its annual invasion by a sprawling green blob. It goes extends to one kilometer. You can't uh, escape. The slimy green intruder is a kind of algae called sea lettuce. So what's all this got to do with the weather? Well, in the springtime, Heavy rainfall washes fertilizer from the surrounding farmland and it all ends up in the sea, where the algae go mad for it, reproducing like crazy and filling the bay with floating goo. 
In China, this surf come turf is a harmless nuisance. But on the other side of the globe, an altogether different green tide is a deadly threat. That water is green. And not just a little green. It's like pea soup green. In 2011, satellite images show Lake Erie turning green with algae as record rainfall drains fertilizer into this North American landmark. Zen Archer, a lakeside local from Cleveland, Ohio, is a witness to this mega bloom. I've lived in, Cle in Cleveland all my life, and I've never seen anything like that in the lake before. There is nothing but green, yucky algae everywhere. Unlike the harmless sea lettuce in China, Ohio had been invaded by a killer, blue-green algae. Blue-green algae, or cyanobacteria, produces a toxin called microcystin that can irritate the skin and attack the liver, causing illness and sometimes death. Lake Erie is the shallowest of the Great Lakes, this allows the summer sun to raise its temperature more easily than its deeper neighbors, creating a cozy haven for amorous algae to get it on. And in 2011, the conditions were simply perfect. It had been rainy, but also very, very warm. Combined with not a lot of wind or air resulted in this algae proliferating and filling the water. This isn't a problem that's going to go away easily. Spring times are getting wetter and summers are getting hotter. So as long as farmers keep using fertilizer, the green goo will keep on coming back. Coming up next, what happens when a mountainside dissolves and the tale of two cities as the sun stops traffic in London and the wind wipes out a lakeside resort. Water isn't the only fluid that marches to the call of gravity. Sometimes the forces that hold together a landscape like this one can become unstable, turning solid earth into a fluid mud in the blink of an eye. And the results can be terrifying. Fergen, Austria, August the 4th, 2012. A violent torrent of mud shatters the peace of an alpine summer. Bienhard Asmeyer witnesses the terror. Suddenly, there was this huge sound. Everything was shaking, everybody was shouting outside, it's a mudslide, it's a mudslide. The summer of 2012 sees weeks of baking hot weather that dries and hardens the ground in the mountains above. Then, a sudden rainstorm breaks this material loose. It tumbles downhill, picking up debris. <laughs> until it's a river of mud and boulders as big as cars. Perched on a rooftop, Bienhard captures the enormous mudslide tearing through the town. Mudslides happen when fine particles of earth in a slope become unstable, either by drying out too much, like what happened in Austria, or the opposite effect, too much water, which causes the mud to swell until it can't hold itself together any longer. In both situations, the greatest danger is to the people that live below, because the flow of the mud can pick up huge rocks and boulders on the way down. And of course, the steeper the slope, the faster these rocky projectiles bounce down the mountain. You can imagine two of these coming towards you at 50 miles an hour. Despite the danger, Bienhard keeps filming. 
It was like watching a movie, but you are part of the movie. The three-hour torrent leaves buildings coated with a thick layer of mud. Amazingly, no one is seriously injured. The mudslide triggered the Alpine town's avalanche warning system, giving the residents a precious few seconds to get out of the mudslide's path. The nature is the, is the most powerful thing in the world. And the humankind is just a small spot in it. It's not just the countryside that's threatened by weird weather. Big cities like London can suffer too. In September 2013, the combination of a sunny day and architectural design made one part of the city a little too hot to handle. It all begins as a typical summer's day. But on one corner of the city, it gets so hot, a car starts to buckle and melt. Nearby, a shop doormat gets scorched and a plastic window display bubbles and warps. How can this happen in London, where the city's highest recorded temperature is 38 degrees? The answer lies with a newly built skyscraper known locally as the Walkie Talkie, thanks to its distinctive curved shape. What was happening in London was similar to what I'm doing here. The magnifying glass is concentrating the sun's rays down to a single point on the paper. And that's what was happening to the building. It had a mirrored outside and a concave shape, focusing the sun's rays down to a single point on the pavement. Unfortunately, that was where the car was parked. And believe it or not, the temperature soared to 90 degrees centigrade, almost hot enough to boil water. And definitely hot enough for a traditional British fry-up, cooked in a less than traditional way. To cool things down, the walkie-talkie, or walkie scorchy, as it's now been nicknamed, is going to be given a giant sunshade, making our fresco fry-ups a thing of the past. The effects of the solar death ray in London were short-lived, but some weird weather can leave a lasting scar, like our next story. Epiquen, Argentina. In November 2011, curious sightseers photograph a ruined city recently emerged from beneath the waves of Lake Epiquen, like an eerie Argentine Atlantis. Flash back to the 1960s and 70s, and it's a very different picture. Epiquen is a buzzing lakeside resort. Then in 1985, disaster strikes. A sudden flood engulfs the town under more than nine meters of water. The cause, a single rogue wave that smashes through the town's flood defenses like a tsunami. We usually associate big waves with the sea and not lakes, but there is a simple explanation. Now, we would have all done this before in the bath. If you rock back and forth, at just the right speed, you can create a wave that travels the length of the bath, and we all know what happens. Eventually, all the water goes over the side. <laughs> well, in Argentina, it wasn't a bather that created this big wave, but the wind. It came from just the right angle, at just the right speed, and created a wave called a seiche. Wind-driven seiche waves can happen anywhere the conditions are right, even in a swimming pool, getting bigger and stronger with every surge. The 1985 seiche wave that destroyed Epiquen got so strong it smashed through the dam that protected the town. With no defences, the wave surged through the town, destroying it completely. 
The authorities quickly realized it was easier to abandon the buildings than rebuild the protective dam. So the houses were left knee deep in water. The residents found new homes and the resort became a ghost town. For nearly quarter of a century, Epiquen is lost. But since 2009, the town has been making a comeback. Inch by inch, the waters have receded to reveal a haunting reminder of the strange and sometimes savage power of the weather. Most people see a cloud every single day of their lives. And if you live in the UK, you get to see a fair few more. But it's not often that you see a cloud that makes you stop and stare. And that's exactly what happened in the US in 2012. Sea Isle City, New Jersey, June the 7th, 2012. An ominous cloud looks like an advancing apocalypse. It looks like a real bad boy. In fact, it's a rare roll cloud. It's very unusual. Huge clouds. Whenever and wherever roll clouds appear, they certainly capture people's attention. Isn't that wicked, honey? That's unreal. Cloud expert Gavin Pretapenny explains how these ominous clouds form. Roll clouds look like a long tube of cloud which can stretch from one horizon to the other and is quite low down in the sky. Now these clouds can form out ahead of a storm and as this cold air splays out, it burrows beneath the warmer, moister air that's ahead of the storm. And as it burrows beneath that air, it causes the air to rise and curl over. So the air at the front of the roll cloud is rising. The air at the back of it is sinking. This rising, cooling and falling cycle condenses water vapor into droplets of liquid water, forming a visible cloud. At the same time, the advancing cold front bulldozes this cloud forwards creating an invisible wave of air that rolls the droplets up into a distinctive cigar-like shape. Roll clouds might look dangerous, but they're not, at least not to us on the ground. But what about for anyone who ventures closer? In October 2011, hang glider John Hesch finds out in a close encounter with one of these meteorological giants above the coast of Southern California. That day was special because I, I watched the cloud grow and develop and extend all the way up here and flew it for an hour and watched it dissipate and disappear. The cloud doesn't hurt Hesch. In fact, it helps him to defy gravity. When we fly a hang glider, we're constantly sinking at 200 feet a minute. But when the wind blows hard enough, it counters that sink rate and we can fly around as long as the wind blows. At the front edge of the roll cloud is an updraft. So long as Hesh stays inside it, the rising air will keep him airborne. It's a visible highway in the sky. It defines the lifting area as close to being a bird as, as I know. When they appear, it's, uh, it's a magical afternoon. Magical may be, but judge it wrong, and you could be in for a crash landing. Lifting air is something that gliders live for. If they stay in front of the roll, then they are in consistently rising air. The problem is they also can be rather dangerous because if you find yourself in the back of that wave of air. That's where the air is sinking again. If you don't know what you're doing when you are hang gliding around one of these clouds, you could really get yourself into a lot of trouble. Still to come, volcanic steam devils, eels hit the streets of New Zealand. Eels, eels in the gutter. 
and a tropical paradise turns white. When it rains, the natural thing for you and I to do is to run indoors and take shelter. But I know one slippery creature that takes it as an opportunity to come out of hiding and do a bit of city sightseeing. Just take a look at our next story. Masterton, New Zealand, March 2012. A quiet street becomes an outdoor aquarium. Have you ever had this in your town? Eels. Eels in the gutter. The street is swimming with slippery freshwater eels. Kiwi local Jermaine Kirihi captures the bizarre events on camera. When I got here, there was actually eels swimming in the gutter. I looked down uh, to my left, there was a couple down there. There was, um, they were actually swimming on the footpath. Look at that. Eels on the road. When we got out and actually saw that there was eels swimming around, um, yeah, it was a bit of a shock. So first, first time I've ever, ever seen that in the streets. How did a dozen eels slither into a suburban street? It's down to an exceptionally heavy rainstorm. I just remember the night before it actually, it was raining at least 24 hours non-stop. It normally takes days of rain to flood the streets this badly. So what was going on in New Zealand? The answer, three crucial ingredients. The first ingredient that you need is a thundercloud. The second thing that you need it's for that thundercloud to be holding a vast amount of rain. And finally, you need that storm to unleash all the rainwater onto a small area in a short space of time. A weather event like this in New Zealand is called a weather bomb. When a weather bomb explodes, it can trigger a flash flood. So much water falls so quickly it overwhelms the drainage system. The drains overflow and water surges into the streets. A really torrential flood can flush out anything and everything that floats, including living creatures. They actually came through this drain here. This drain runs to a creek at the back of the house that, that my grandmother lives in. Most of us would be freaked out, but to Jermaine's grandma, they're not scary, they're lunch. My nan actually was encouraging us to go out there, catch them, so she could eat them. But she's old school, so she was, she was keen to have a, have a nice feed of uh, eel. Luckily for the eels, Jermaine has other ideas. Instead of cooking them, he releases them back into the local creek. Is the eels people? Told you we were releasing them, we didn't eat them. So next time it rains, don't forget your umbrella and your fishing rod. Volcanoes are known as a force that shapes the landscape, but they can also shape the weather. And sometimes the results can be breathtaking. the Kilauea volcano, Hawaii. As tourists watch lava pour into the Pacific, a twisting vortex spirals up from the ocean. It looks like a mini tornado, but there's not a storm cloud in sight. The Kilauea tornado is actually a steam devil, a type of whirlwind that forms over warm water or damp land as steam rises into cold air. At the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, creator Jennifer Moss Logan shows how this works. What we have here is a box. It has slits in the side to allow air in. Right here is a hot plate, and on the hot plate are coins. Those coins represent the lava. What I have here is a little tin of water. This water represents the ocean water. Let's see what happens when we add the ocean water to the lava. 
When water meets hot lava, it turns to steam. This starts to mix with the cold air around it. More air is drawn in from the surrounding area, creating a circular air current that spins the escaping steam. That rising column of steam, that's the vortex. The air is rushing in and circulating around and causing that, that beautiful vortex. That is our steam devil. Kilauea steam devils grow so big and strong that they can often be mistaken for water spouts. But there is an easy way to tell them apart. Water spouts form from clouds, so if you follow them up, you'll see the cloud that made them. Whereas steam devils are simply generated by warm, damp air rising. So if you see a twister out at sea and not a cloud in sight, the chances are it's a steam devil. And you don't have to travel to Hawaii to see one. Steam devils occasionally form over lakes and rivers, like these ones dancing across the surface of a river in the US. They form in the same way as the ones at Kilauea. The only difference is here it's the sun that heats the water and not hot lava. Steam devils may be weird, but they're also beautiful. Sometimes it's not the weather that's weird, it's where it takes place. Just like our next story. Malua Bay, Australia. October the 14th, 2013. It's a warm 30 degrees and residents are enjoying the beach. But the next day, they wake up to an unbelievable sight. The bay's beach looks like it's being blanketed in snow. My feet are going numb, I think we should go. A huge storm has struck overnight, sending temperatures plummeting. So what was going on? Well, the first clue is what fell on the beach. What looked like snow was actually a thick layer of hail. Hail is rain that freezes as it rises up inside a storm cloud. Storm clouds form when hot, moist air surges upwards. But along the coast, cooler ocean temperatures mean the air is rarely hot enough to spawn a storm cloud. So why does Malua Bay get blanketed by hail? Thunderstorms in Australia at that time of year aren't uncommon, but what was very unusual is that the thunderstorm was so big, with so much hail, and so close to the sea, it seemed incredibly unlikely. Something else must have triggered the weird weather, and that something was raging further inland. In surrounding New South Wales, soaring temperatures spark over 70 wildfires. Wildfires heat the air around them, causing the air to rise very rapidly. And in Australia, all that air rising from the wildfires powered up the thunderclouds, making them much, much stronger. And the convective currents helped them to produce a lot more hail. And once the clouds cleared the fires, they dumped this massive hail right on the beach. Turning this surfer's paradise into a winter wonderland. Coming up next on the world's weirdest weather. The sun stops traffic in New York. Oh, there it is. Whirlpools so big, you can only see them from space. They're very big, they're very powerful. You have no choice but to go with the flow. That's the whirlpool turning the boat. The sculpting power of the wind. And could this be Earth's most powerful lightning? Oh. Weird weather can disrupt our lives. A mudslide can wipe away a whole community and flash floods can bring a city to its knees. But there's another type of weird weather that can stop traffic for very different reasons. 
New York, July the 13th, 2012. A crowd gathers near Grand Central Station to witness a bizarre natural wonder. Oh, there it is. Astrophysicist Jackie Fahiti explains what happens. This place would be mobbed with photographers, pedestrians, people that just sort of randomly stumbled upon it, all looking in the direction of New Jersey to the west. On two days each year, the sun lines up exactly with Manhattan's dead straight east-west cross streets. The result is a sunset that New Yorkers call Manhattan Henge. So from this spot, you just look straight west past Times Square. The sun sets right between these buildings, framed perfectly. You get a gorgeous view of the sun right there kissing the grid as it sets. Manhattan Henge is named after our own Stonehenge. And you don't have to be a druid to know the stones line up with the rising sun on the longest day of the year. But while Stonehenge's solar alignment is an ancient mystery, Manhattan's is just a cosmic coincidence. At nearby Rutgers University, Physicist David Mayulo explains why. Here's our model of the setting and rising sun. And this is our homemade model of Manhattan. We all know that the sun appears to rise in the east and set in the west, but it's actually more complex than that. Towards the summertime, the sun appears to move towards the north, and towards the wintertime, the sun appears to move towards the south. It changes its position along the horizon. As the sun moves north through the winter and spring, it lines up perfectly with Manhattan's cross streets around the end of May. Then after the longest day of the year in June, the sunset starts to move south, setting in line with the grid around mid-July. Twice a year, the setting and rising sun goes right down those east-west streets, and that leads to a beautiful effect we call Manhattan Henge. So if you find yourself in the Big Apple at the end of May or mid-July, you could be lucky enough to see a sunset you'll never forget. Some weird weather events are so big that you need to stand a long way back to admire them. And in the case of our next story, a long, long, long way back. The Cape of Good Hope South Africa, December the 26th, 2011. A satellite spots what looks at first like a hurricane at sea. In fact, it's a massive 90 mile wide whirlpool. For oceanographer Simon Boxall, photos like this have huge scientific importance. When we first started observing the oceans from space, one of the very first features we looked at were these rings. We knew they existed, but seeing them from space was absolutely amazing. The massive whirlpool has spun off the Agullas Current, which runs down the east coast of Africa and turns near the Cape of Good Hope. They're very big, they're very important, but they're also very harmless because they're moving at maybe one or two miles an hour. Gentle giants like this can be seen in every ocean and are a result of the strong winds and currents circulating around the world. Whirlpools are also created by underwater volcanoes and earthquakes. But the most dangerous are found when a large mass of water is forced through a narrow gap. These whirlpools are very real. I've certainly been caught in whirlpools in the past. Um, they can be quite scary, you can do nothing about them, and they do occur anywhere where we get very strong flows. The Salt Straumann Strait in Norway might look quite calm, but in fact, it has the world's strongest tidal current, which creates the most powerful whirlpool on Earth. Over 100 billion gallons of water squeezes through this narrow channel every six hours. That's the equivalent of 160,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. While in the Straits of Corryvreckan, it's the rocky Scottish seabed that turns the onrushing tide into fearsome whirlpools. Actually, the whirlpool turning the boat. 
Even though it's tiny in comparison to its giant South African cousin, when the wind's blowing, its roar can be heard over 10 miles away. Whirlpools tend to be fairly small affairs. Um, very powerful, but you have no choice but to go with the flow. So it's a good idea to treat whirlpools like the twisters of the water world and get out of their way. Here in the UK, we're lucky to have such dramatic coastlines like this. These rocks have been eroded into these rugged shapes by the sea. In other countries, some even weirder rock structures exist and some hundreds of miles away from the nearest ocean. What shapes them is the wind. The White Desert, Egypt. Weird, giant mushrooms appear to sprout from the ground. In Turkey, strange castles rise from the rock. And an ocean of stripy waves flow across Arizona's desert. They look for all the world like contemporary art. But the only sculptor here is the weather. These are pedestal rocks, and they're made when the top layer of rock is harder than the rock below. Over time, wind and sand wears away the weaker rock, leaving the harder rock impossibly balanced on top. The most famous pedestal rocks are the crazy castles of Cappadocia in Turkey. Over thousands of years, locals have carved these weird-looking formations into homes, forming a village of hobbit-like caves. The pinnacles here are known as fairy chimneys or hoodoos, and they were formed by ancient volcanoes spewing tough basalt rock over softer rock, which sand and wind cut away to leave the hoodoos behind. And some of them are huge, the size of 14-storey buildings with multiple homes carved out of them like a tower block. And check out this psychedelic sea of stripes in Coconino County, Arizona. Over time, layers of sand lay down and solidify to form rock. Then the wind erodes the rock, revealing a candy stripe slice through history. It's amazing just what the wind and sand can do. Last up on World's Weirdest Weather, we're going out with a bang. What you're about to witness could be Earth's most powerful lightning. Woodward, Oklahoma, May 27, 2001. Two storm chasers are driving along a barren highway when they spot this. A lightning bolt that lasts for almost three seconds, surging with a hundred times the power of an ordinary strike. This is a super bolt. <laughs> Lightning expert Joe Dwyer explains more. We've known about these superbolts for decades. We're still not certain exactly what they are, whether it's a, an observational peculiarity or it's actually something to do with how lightning works. Superbolts appear to be on the rare end of the spectrum. It's not quite clear how rare they are, but they seem to be just on the right at the tail of what lightning can do. Superbolts may make up less than 1% of all lightning strikes. However, this extreme form of lightning can strike anytime, anywhere. And they've been witnessed in every corner of the world. We can see distribution of little lightning and big lightning from most thunderstorms. So I would say that uh, any thunderstorm uh, could potentially make a very big Super Bowl. Some experts believe that Super Bowls may be related to a rare weather event called positive lightning. 
Lightning comes in sort of two flavors, positive and negative. When you look at the real big stuff, that all tends to be positive. And so the inference is the Super Bowls also would be positive lightning. Negative lightning is the more common form and tends to come from the bottom of the storm cloud. Positive lightning is rarer and usually comes from the top or anvil of the cloud. And it's more powerful than negative lightning. While it's possible that superbolts can be either positive or negatively charged, it is certain that they are the rarest and most powerful of all. Personally, I find Super Bowls kind of scary. If a Super Bowl hit a house, I would not want to be in it. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, pretty light. Oh. So that's it for this episode. But you never know when the next crazy weather event is going to happen. So keep your cameras at the ready. And next time, it could be you capturing the world's weirdest weather. Next Monday, Jamie's back with some new money-saving meals. How about some frugal hangover noodles? Could have done with them yesterday. That's at 8.30. New homes and business premises required. Phil and Kirsty with location tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. But next up, a starved and volatile camp turning on each other. Unmissable, the island.